Our gospel reading this morning is from Matthew, chapter 4, verses 12 through 23. Now when Jesus heard that John had been arrested, he withdrew to Galilee. He left Nazareth and made his home in Capernaum by the sea, in the territory of Zebulun and Naphtali, so that, when he had been, so that what had been spoken through the prophet Isaiah might be fulfilled. Land of Zebulun, land of Naphtali, on the road by the sea, across the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people who sat in darkness have seen a great light, and for those who sat in the region in shadow of death, light has dawned. From that time, Jesus began to proclaim, repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. As he walked by the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, who was called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And he said to them, follow me, and I will make you fish for people. Immediately they left their nets and followed him. As he went from there, he saw two other brothers, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, in the boat with their father Zebedee, mending their nets. And he called them. Immediately they left the boat and their father and followed him. Jesus went through Galilee, throughout Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and curing every disease and every sickness among the people. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks, thanks be, be to God. God. Yes, thanks be to God for these wonderful lessons. Now, if you were humming in your head, I will make you fishers of men, we're not going to focus on that part of the lesson. We did that with the kids this morning. We want to look at the first part of the lesson this morning from Matthew's Gospel. When Jesus heard that John had been arrested, he withdrew to Galilee. His cousin John. Now last week's sermon was called what? Do like Drew. Today it's going to be, be like the Zebedees, the Zebedee boys, the brothers, the sons of Zebedee. So Jesus in last week's gospel walks by and his cousin John says, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, remember? And who was it who heard that and went to his brother and said, We have seen the Messiah? Andrew. Now Andrew is out with Peter fishing. We don't know if it's the same, because it was a different gospel. That was John we read last week. Today is Matthew. Different writers, different focus for each one. But we don't know what, if they were meant to be one before the other, or if they were just two different stories told by two different men. And we don't know if they're true, but we don't know what order they happened in. But John is arrested, and Jesus goes to Galilee, and he makes his home in Capernaum by the sea in the territory of Zebulun and Naphtali, so that what had been spoken through the prophet Isaiah might be fulfilled. We read the whole prophecy this morning, the first four verses of it. We usually read that during Advent, and what follows that? He shall be called what? Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Just as in last week's Gospel, we heard Jesus called what? Lamb of God, Son of God, Messiah, and Rabbi. Different titles for Jesus. But what is this that Jesus is preaching now? He is preaching the repentance of sin, the same thing his cousin John had done. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. I want you all to do me a favor and stand up a moment. I want you to face the back of the sanctuary. What do you see? What do you see back there? You see the tech team, I know. What else do you see back there? See our mission statement as you're going out the door? I want you to turn this way and tell me what you see up here. You see the cross, you see Jesus with his family, you see the candle that represents the light of Christ coming into the world. It's a different view, isn't it? That is what the word repent means. You can sit down now if you'd like. Or you can stand up if you'd like. I'm not going to tell you what to do here. That's what the word repent literally means, to turn into a different direction, to turn around. And if you're turning from things in the world, you're going to have to turn towards something else. We hope you're turning toward Jesus Christ. Some people turn from big ticket items big things that they need to change in their lives, addictions or abuse or other things. Some people turn from a life of crime. I've had people in the, the world, in my ministry, who have turned from all sorts of things to Jesus Christ. 
One man I know had been, in his own words, a falling down drunk. That was what he called himself. I was a falling down drunk one day. Christ spoke to him literally, and he gave it up and never had another drink again in his life. It's a remarkable story. Most people need more help than that, but he just gave it up once and for all. I've seen people change their lives totally because of an experience of grace in Jesus Christ. Now, you have to ask yourself, what is there to turn from in the world? Because, you know, we can look at people like that and say, well, at least I'm not like that guy. But what are the things, the smaller ticket items, the smaller sins, those little white sins that we might need to give up along the way? Maybe it's how we talk to other people. Maybe it's how we swear when we drive. That would be mine. You'd think I was a sailor if you heard me in the car when I'm there by myself sometimes. I work on that. I really do, because I do not like being that way. But I can get so riled up in the car, it's outrageous. I never do anything. I'm not a road rage person, but I just sit, sit there and say, you idiot, you stupid piece of stuff, and as they drive by me. Especially every time I'm past going up Benita Avenue on a double yellow line or where there's no line on the single bridge because somebody needs to get home five minutes before I do. Sometimes it's just the despair we feel or the hopelessness we feel. Sometimes it's just saying, let somebody else do it. There are all sorts of things to give up. But what are we called to do in the Corinthian passage? To be of one mind. How many of you think it makes since when Paul says, Now I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you be in agreement and there be no divisions among you, but you be united in the same mind and the same purpose. My husband and I often said we came from a mixed marriage. He was a Southern Baptist boy who married an ordained Methodist girl. That's about as mixed up as you can get. But his parents were just equally as kind of different. His mother was a staunch Southern Baptist lady, as was his father, was the Southern Baptist by tradition more than theology. She was a Republican, he was a Democrat. They decided never to speak about things like politics in the house because my mother-in-law was fond of saying to people, if you think that, you can just get out right now. I learned to just be quiet and say hello to when I saw her. Hi, Mom, how you doing? But um, my husband's oldest sister is now a United Methodist because she had a Methodist friend when she was in high school. And she said she would make sure every Saturday night, if she spent the night away from home, she would spend it with her Methodist friend because her Methodist friend would take her to church with her. And she said, now, you've got to understand, if you go to the Southern Baptist Church, the sermon alone is either an hour to an hour and a half to two hours long. You hear about going to hell, all the ways you've disappointed God and how you're going to go to hell. She said, or you can go to the Methodist Church where the entire service is an hour, and all you hear about is how much Jesus loves you. She said, that's why I'm a Methodist. Well, that's a little simplistic, but I understand what she's talking from. But we've got to ask ourselves, what are we turning from when the book, when we leave the boat? What are we turning from? Are we turning from one life to another? Are we running from the wrath that is to come, fleeing the wrath that is to come? Or are you running toward Jesus whose arms are wide open to you? That's a question only you can answer about your own life. But um, let's look a minute at James and John, the sons of Zebedee. What do you know about fishermen in the first century? I told the kids, they're not, they were not looked upon as people with much to offer the world. They were low-level laborers. They were common. They, were, they smelled like fish. They worked all night. They slept during the day if they could. They sold fish during the day. We think of them as not having much to offer, but Jesus saw potential in them because they knew what it meant to work hard, not to give up if things got tough. They also knew that fishermen were among the most um, multicultural people of the day because they would deal with other folks. They would deal with people from other countries who spoke other languages. They would learn little smatterings of language. A few years ago, I took a course called Pastoral Spanish where I learned some things about, I could talk to people about Jesus. Sort of like when I learned sign language in deaf ministry, I learned how to say angel and God and things like that, but not how's the weather. But I had a secretary for several years who was from El Salvador, and we practiced my Spanish with her. We always did the calendar every week in Spanish, and she'd say, I pray to God you get where you're supposed to be, Pastor Terry. Or if I'd say something, so she'd say, oh, you're so cute, you're so cute, you're so cute. No idea what I was saying half the time. I didn't get to practice it after she left, and when you don't practice the language, you tend to lose it. But there was a day when there was, we had an outdoor event at the church. I think it was a yard sale, something like that, some sort of outdoor festival, and a little boy whose parents were Latino, 
He was Latino too and did not, his parents did not speak English and he didn't seem to speak much English. He was about three or four years old, ran in front of a car. Without thinking, I said, Donde es su mamá? Where's your mother? And he looked at me like, oh my golly, and ran and grabbed his mother's hand and held it like that woman knows what, what she's talking about. Because that's the fishermen. They could, they could speak little bits of language so they could share the gospel in more than one language. And what do we know about Zebedee? Nothing. We don't know if he had talked with his sons about the sky, if they were part of the group when Andrew had said to Peter, come and see the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. We found the Messiah. Remember the story we read last week? We don't know if Zebedee said, good, go with him, or if Zebedee was like, come back. Because when his sons left him, he was there alone fishing. We don't know what happened, but we know that Jesus was so compelling in his call that they had to get up and leave. How many of you have felt called to something in your life? Maybe called to be a member of this congregation, maybe called to do the job you do, because the call is not just reserved for people like me. Everyone who is a disciple of Jesus Christ was called to share the gospel, which is why Paul said, it's a good thing I didn't baptize all of you, because then you'd say, if you belong to me, you don't belong to me, you belong to Christ. Was Paul crucified for you? Heck no. Jesus Christ is the one that you are baptized into. He is the one who calls you. He is the one who equips you through the power of his Holy Spirit to do the things that he needs to have done in the world. So I don't think that the call is only for ordained ministry. I think the call upon every servant of Jesus Christ is to share the gospel, the good news of who he is. So I hope you'll be like the Zebedees. I hope you'll do like Drew, like last week, and say to somebody, I have seen the Messiah. And this week, like the Zebedee brothers, when they hear the call, they get up and they leave immediately. Immediately they go. And I hope that you're called to the job that you do in your secular life as well, because I think that there are callings. I don't think anybody is a nurse or a caretaker of health without being called to do it. This is after being with my mom and seeing some of the things these ladies do without blinking to help her out. There are those of you who volunteer your time in different organizations. We have some GBMC volunteers here today, and yesterday we heard about Don Neely and how hard he worked when he was able to volunteer his time and his life at GBMC. Some of you are teachers, and some of you, those who work in Educational institutions, I pay for every one of you by name every day that you'll be safe in those institutions. I pray for Lambert because he is a grad student. I pray for his daughter who's in college. I pray for everybody by name. We've got two Megans, two Sarahs. we got two Drews. I'm like, God bless Drew and Drew. Megan, Megan, Sarah, Sarah. I do them in alphabetical order because that makes me think every day about who I do. Sometimes I'll say, whoops, I forgot Ethan, and I'll go back and it's Emma, Ethan, Ezra. But um, I get everybody in because I think those of you who teach and who work in education are answering a calling. But we've got to think about what we're called to do in the world. We've got to think about how we answer Jesus Christ. I love the anthem this morning. Softly and tenderly, Jesus is calling. Sometimes it's soft and tenderly. Sometimes Jesus has a cattle prod going, come on, come on, come on, I need this to be done. But to say, I have decided to follow Jesus, no turning back, no turning back is what you need to do and sing it as joyfully as the choir did. We're going to sing two hymns this morning. One is a modern um, hymn, and I know how much I love modern hymns here. We're going to follow that up with an old time one, but the modern hymn and the old hymn are the same. One's called Two Fishermen. And you good Christians, one and all who'd follow Jesus' way, come leave behind what keeps you bound to trappings of our day. And listen as he calls your name and come to follow near, where still he speaks in varied ways to those whose call we hear. Leave all things you have and come and follow me and come and follow me. We're going to do the older one called Jesus Calls Us or the Tumult. Jesus calls us from the worship of the vain world's golden store, from each idol that would keep us saying, Christian, love me more. In our joys and in our sorrows, days of toil and hours of ease, till he calls through cares and pleasures, Christian, love me more than these. Jesus calls us by thy mercy, Savior. May we hear thy call. Give our hearts to thine obedience. Serve and love thee best of all. Whether you understand the older language or the newer language, know that Jesus Christ is calling you, calling one and all. You don't have to be older to be called. You don't have to be young to be called. You can be called at any age. Um, I was called the first time, I think when I was 10 years old, I'd been to an ordination service. 
my teacher, Mrs. Munio, who is Greek Orthodox, said to us one day, what do you want to be when you grow up? And I said, I want to be the first woman bishop of the Methodist Church because I had been to ordination and there were all these men lined up and the bishop, they were all on their knees and the bishop went and put a hand on each one's head. It was like a divine game of duck, duck, goose. He turned just regular people into pastors. So I thought, what a great job that must be to turn a person into a pastor. I want to do that. Fortunately, I told that story at Youth Assembly one year, and Bishop Yackel walked in and heard it, and he rolled his eyes, and he said to me later, how long was it until you were called to ministry? And I said, oh, that was years later. But Jesus speaks to you, whether you're a kid, whether you're a senior citizen, whether you are on your deathbed, there is something God has for you to do. You just have to listen to the call. you got to be ready to turn from whatever it is that's got you from keeping to follow him now, whether it's an addiction or whether it's just being grumpy or whether it's like in money more than giving it away. Whatever it is, God can take care of that, and God can use you and will use you if you just say yes to the call. So do like Drew and tell somebody, I've seen the Messiah, come and see, and be like the Zebedee, and when he calls, get up out of the boat and follow him. No turning back, no turning back, no turning back. Amen. Amen, amen.